can't spell intellectual right now, but what do you have, do you have a question for me? Yeah, I want to talk about um, The Crow real quick. I know I was just listening to the story, but I didn't get to hear the whole thing you were telling the other other people. Well, I had the, uh, the, the lovely opportunity to work with Brandon Lee on The Crow. I was the Skull Cowboy. We had scenes that, some of it is in the kitchen, uh, well, there's a book called The Making of the Crow, Kitchen Sink Press Publishers. There's four pages, a couple pictures of me with Brandon, and it describes the whole concept of who the Skull Cowboy was. He was the first avenging spirit, and then his fiance died, and he, was, he died too, because the rules were kill the ones that killed you both or you will not be reunited with your beloved. Well, the same thing happened to Brandon Lee's character, Eric Draven. He started to see Sarah and other people in need and, and that were in jeopardy, so he was compelled to help them. But the footage that we did not see in the final edit of the film was where I, pull, I summoned him out of the grave we did film it, and I, I warned him that he that he will never be reunited unless he follows the rules. And then there's another scene that's um, in some video footage on the internet where we practice the lighting sequence where I disintegrate and I leave with the crow, and then at, toward the end of the movie the crow reappears and, and hits the girl in the eyes and, and saves them. The experience of doing a crow is absolutely phenomenal. My favorite scene is when the mother is confronted by Eric Draven and he goes, heroin is bad for you, and the heroin comes out of her arm and he says, mother is the name for God in the hearts and lips of all children. Your daughter needs you. Go to her. And she cries. As a local actress, and she knocked it out of the park. Great scene. Brandon was engaged to Elijah and we were really hoping that he would have a long run. Unfortunately, what happened in North Carolina was this. States that don't appreciate labor unions have a clause that says after so many weeks of production, you can force the production company to hire local people. The local people they hired were our armorer, the gentleman in charge of our guns. They sent our guy back to Los Angeles. And then they were trying to speed up production, and it was dark most of the time, and there was some debris in the barrel. It was not a, a hit or a murder, it was a horrible accident. And you should take a flashlight and stick it down the barrel of the, of the gun to see if there's anything in the grooves. We had blanks that had crimped, and a little piece of metal was in a groove and they didn't look thoroughly, and so when they had a full charge blank for the boom, that piece of debris, shrapnel, came out of the muzzle of the gun and went into him, and he bled to death. I had a phone call after it had happened from my producer and director, and we were in horrible agony, and it was terrible. And when I hung up, my phone rang for the rest of the day from Various news agencies, mostly rag sheets, that wanted to know if I had killed Brandon. And I asked one of them, I go, why are you asking me if I killed Brandon Lee? He said, because I have a call sheet, and there were three Michaels, and you're a Michael. So one of the three Michaels uh, shot the gun and killed Brandon. And I told him very honestly, I said, well, sir, number one, I have a question for you. Uh, how much did you pay to get my home phone number? It's unlisted. He wouldn't tell me. And I said, okay, it's going to sound like I'm hanging up. I hung up. And I called a very dear friend. I said, please drive me to my friend's bar. And I'm going to get, I'm going to drink till I am absolutely passed out. I'm in so much pain. And I'm going to tell you a very sad story. And that's exactly what happened. It was horrible. I was pretty depressed for a long time, so was my other friends that worked on the film. And Brandon Lee was an amazingly spiritual person and deserved to have a long future and to be married and spend his life with his beloved. So the irony was, of course, obviously challenging and difficult to deal with. I was in grief for quite a while, and 
I have footage from David Scow who wrote our screenplay two hours it showed his a lot of on a set footage his birthday party Brandon playing his guitar wonderful things and it's personal I, I've had people offer me all kinds of money for it and I said no it's no one it's, it's personal but I'm a big believer in safety on the set and so to anyone who's listening to this if you're an actor and you're on a set you can be an A-lister or not if you feel unsafe you have the right and the responsibility to say stop explain it let's make it safe now didn't you say something about you visit the, the grave site or, or you were saying something like that yes I live in uh, Washington State and once a month I go to Seattle to Brandon and Bruce Lee's uh, uh, memorial to pay my respects now, and it's open to the public, or is it a private? It's open to the public. Now, all the footage you guys shot, though, did, did you guys get to finish the movie the way you wanted to before? No. I had a phone call after I was told of his death, and I had spoken to James O'Barr, and I was begging my ex uh, producers to film the three confrontations of Eric Draven and the Skull Cowboy in the loft, where I asked him three times if he would please comply with the rules, which are kill the ones that killed you both, or you will not be reunited with your beloved. And there's a scene where he and I say, if you don't, you're dead. And he says, I'm already dead. It's very powerful. It puts the story into perspective. What they were concerned with was that if they had another actor, it wouldn't look like Brandon. And I had suggested that they put the makeup on the face, they shoot it in shadow, and we do the best we could. Because I believe James O'Barr's legacy of writing his story from his fiance being killed by a drunk driver and then Brandon's passing and his loss and Elijah's loss, I thought it would, it would serve everyone well to honor the original content of the story. It didn't happen and they made subsequent um, other Crow films which I, I will never watch. There is, wor uh, there is rumors that there will be another Crow original. I did talk with James about it and he told me that he would like to have it in graphic novel style. The original story with the Skull Cowboy, and of course, he would like me to play the Skull Cowboy. The only obvious issue is, of course, when they hire a director, they want to do it their way, so I, I really doubt if it'll ever be honored to the original content of the original storyline. I would hope for Brandon and, and my dear friend um, James that it would be so, and it would be very good for me to finish the story. It would help me heal completely. It was very difficult to deal with all of what happened. Well, that that actually spawns in my other question is, do you believe like today in the society where they're making all these remakes and, and new stories and they're trying to bring back things, do you believe that they're trying to, like, like I don't know if you're a Turtles fan or anything like that, but do you believe that they... they want to do it for another generation and I, I feel like they ruin it because as a remake I feel like you should respect and honor the things that happened for the for the very first one and some of them don't do that well remakes do happen Frankenstein Dracula's Godzilla's generations I believe can appreciate a new version of a classic if it's done respectfully. So I'm not against remakes, but I do have a problem with remakes that are basically profit-driven and there's no emotional content. Bruce Lee said in, I think it was End of the Dragon where they're going to Han's tournament and, and the British guy is saying, will you accept this mission? And Bruce Lee says it's it's Lao's time, a young boy is teaching martial arts, and the boy takes a stance, and Bruce says, not in anger. It's like pointing your finger to the, to the moon. Don't focus on your finger, 
because you will miss out on all of that celestial glory. So, if you're going to do a remake, watch the original, find out what it was that really inspired you within the realm of storytelling, because that's what movies are about. Otherwise, it becomes a commercial advertisement for selling product later. So I'm not against remakes. What I'm for is to inspire people to tell a good story, write a good script, have some emotional content. Don't make it just a commercial advertisement. Now, if there's one movie that you enjoyed that was a remake and one movie that you did not enjoy that thought should be made, what two are they? The good one and the bad one of the remakes. On a good re remake, I would have to say Jack Black's King Kong. On a bad remake, I would say both of the Hills Have Eyes remakes. Because the Hills Have Eyes remakes basically... After 10 or 15 minutes, I didn't care that people were dying. It was just a bunch of gimmicks, slash, chase, kill. And if you don't have any emotional attachment to the victim, then how can the person that prevails be a hero? I found them very weak. I found them very superficial and a, wa a waste of time. I hope they made their money back so they could make a film that really mattered. Now, speaking of Hills Have Eyes, um, the original came out, what, 1977? Am I right? I think that's close, yes. Na 1977. Uh, and how many days of uh, shooting did you guys do? Uh, total production, I'm, I'm guessing it's six weeks. I was all on and off again over a period of about four weeks. Um, and then you guys shot in the desert, correct? Just like the other ones? Yes, we did. Well, actually, uh, the original was... Uh, east of Palmdale near Victorville. The second one was down in Morongo Valley. Now, if there's anything like cuckoo, strange, or weird that happened on the set that you can remember? Well, strange. Uh, for instance, in the first one, we had to have a rattlesnake, so they... I actually lived in Lucerne Valley area, which is kind of a creepy area. Jim Jones lived there for a while. Um, strange people choose to live in the desert for different reasons. So when they asked some locals if they could get a rattlesnake to be on the set, some guy said, yeah, I have one. It was his pet. <laughs> if your pet is a rattlesnake, there's something not quite right with you. Now, I lived in the area, and I noticed that it was not just a rattlesnake. It had some coloration. It was a Mojave green. Mojave green rattlesnake has neuro and muscle toxin. They're as deadly as a cobra. So one day at lunch... Everybody's running out of the way, and the snake had gotten out of the little box it was in. And he did have monofilament line through the top and bottom of his jaw, made a little hole, so it couldn't open its mouth wide enough to bite you. It was a big snake. One of our actresses picked it up and walked it over to our producer, and he ran away. And then the guy who owned the snake came running over, and he goes, Oh, my God. And then when he put it back in the, kit in the box, I said to him, why on earth would you bring a Mojave Green? He goes, oh, you know about them? Yeah. So, it was guerrilla filmmaking, but it was, I guess you could call that weird. It was dangerous. When I did Hills 2, well, actually, when I did Hills 1, I was dressed as Pluto, and Papa Jupiter was dressed as Papa Jupiter, and we decided to go play golf dressed like that. We were having fun until some ladies came up to us in a golf cart and said, gentlemen, you have to wear shirts. And Jimmy Wirt, Whitworth goes, well, who, who are you, the damn uh, rules committee or something? And they go, well, actually, we are. So we had a good laugh, hopped in our golf carts, and ran away from them. <laughs> it really happened. Um, and uh, one flew of the cuckoo nest. I heard you, you, if I'm not correctly, you said 172 days? 127 for 127 me. days. Yeah, two weeks of rehearsal with real patients, going over major scenes, blocking lighting. I learned a lot. That's where I learned what the camera does and what everybody's job was and why it's important to pay attention to what they're doing. I learned my craft. The emotional part comes from your director and your sensibilities and your understanding of human emotion. Is there anything... Um, how was it working with Jack Nicholson? I mean, uh, an Oscar winner of, of him. Jack told me in the, when we first met that if, he, that if he was as tall as I was, he would not be an actor. He would be an NBA star. 
and he has a passion for it. We actually filmed around his uh, around the Portland Trailblazers basketball schedule, so Jack could attend all of the games. He loves the sport very much. He's also one of the most honest, straight-up guys I've ever met. He's very talented. And he's a good dad, and uh, I have a ton of admiration for my friend. Absolutely. Uh, now, do you stay in contact with some of the people you film with? Well, not really. We run across each other sometimes at film festivals, etc., once in a while at a charity event. It's always good to see each other. I ran into Chris Lloyd a little while back, and, you know, we look at each other. We go, wow, a few more miles. We're looking good. How are you? That kind of stuff. Once you do a film like Cuckoo's Nest, a film like that, you, you become family forever, which is a really great experience. It's funny you brought up Christopher Lloyd because I'm a huge Back to the Future fan. I feel like that character kind of made his his way into how everything comes out. But I got a friend uh, that tells me that Christopher Lloyd's not a big actor. A now, big actor? No, well, he's not a he's not a great actor. He hasn't done a lot of iconic roles. Really? But. but I mean, for me and you sitting here talking, I can name five off the top of my head that he pretty much uh, patented the characters, uh, you know, going down the road, you know, um, Chris, Ro Roger Rabbit, uh, Adam's Family. Uh, well, Christopher Lloyd is a very thorough actor. What I mean by that is we did, uh, we did a film with Claude Lelouch, director, and Genevieve Bougeau. I think it was in Phoenix or Old Tucson it was, and Chris had a small part where he was to play Jesse James. So he researched Jesse James, and at his own expense, got some contact lenses that were the same color as the eyes of Jesse James. So anyone that says he's not a big actor, they're misinterpreting what big means. To me, you can have a small part and steal a scene, but that's not what we're about. It's about bringing life to your character. Chris is a phenomenal actor, and so, you know, what is big? You're on the cover of magazines, or you're a millionaire. I've had people come up to me and go, hey, man, you a millionaire? Where's your Bentley? I go, I said, if I was a millionaire, young man, I, I would have a, another four-wheel drive truck. I'm a truck guy. I, I'm not, and, and if you gave me a BMW, I would trade it in and buy a truck. I, <laughs> you like off-roading. Well... I like to be able to have a vehicle that I can uh, depend on. I, I, I like the Mazdas, if we're talking cars. I like the Mazdas, they ride really good. I, I, I'm, I would like to get one of the old Mark IV Lincoln town cars that don't make them anymore. I like a good ride, but I've never been one to be inclined to get the latest bells and whistles and bling bling this or whatever. It means nothing to me. you have any upcoming projects that you want to uh, discuss before we... Uh... Oh, uh, well, I have an older movie with Eddie Furlong called Below Zero. It's a great thriller. I hope you get the chance to see that. Chad Verde Productions, did, we did a movie with Tony Todd, Sully Erna, and Joey Fatone called Army of the Damned. It's a good movie. The film Brutal, I have a great part in that. It's an older one. Check it out. I also, I'm hoping to be on a TV show on Sci-Fi Channel, I don't want to mention the name and, and uh, jinx it, but they're supposedly writing a part for me, that would be wonderful. Um, I've got some other projects, but I, I will uh, support them once we're, you know, it's a done deal, so to speak. Where can they find you if they want to know anything? I'm on, I'm on Facebook, I have 5,000 friends, but if... If I recognize you, I might bump some people off and add you, but I'm on Michael Berryman on Facebook and on my feed, not the home, I mean my feed, not the one where everybody posts, because I tidy that up. You know, if there's advertisements or stuff I don't feel is appropriate, I, I delete it. And I have people posting wonderful, wonderful, positive, uplifting critter things, philosophical things, uh, and, and I... I, I tidy it up and I, and I repost a lot of the really great ones on my page. For instance, Cats Knocking Shit Over, the happiest elephant in the world playing with a, a blue ribbon. Um, the Rottweiler uh, rescuing his chihuahua buddy from coyotes. Uh, the video of the guy visiting his animal, his uh, lion friends, and they are loving all over him. The guy, uh, you see a swollen river and an arm of a human, and he's holding a baby fawn to protect it. Uh, I'm huge on the environment, a future for our children. I hate war. 
I hate globalization and corporations that are, it's all about money and no future. I, I post some politically uh, important things, especially from like a five-star general and president of the United States named Dwight D. Eisenhower, who warned us of the military-industrial complex. Uh, so war for profit is a sin. Uh, I also post things that are important about health and nutrition and what real food and nutrition is. And I encourage people to be informed and and have some humanity in your heart. So you're 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 pretty big in the the uh, multimedia. I mean, you do a lot on there, and you you stay with your you stay in contact with your fans. I check my Facebook page daily, except when I'm at shows. I don't bring my computer with me. But when I get home in the morning tomorrow, I'll, I'll be checking it. And, and I have I've met people at shows that have been friends on Facebook, and it, it's it, it's really good. And I believe the world can be a better place. Our children get to fix it. So I'm very huge on education and anti-bullying and people uh, not harming women. Uh, what's going on in the NFL right now makes me disgusted. Uh, Are you a sports person? Well, I don't know. What does that mean? Do you, 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 you like watching college football, basketball, NFL? I was a long-distance runner in high school and javelin thrower in college. I appreciate people, under, uh, people taking the time and the effort to be good at what they do, and you're limited, you're limited by your, your, your skill level. But I am not for worshiping. Uh, my rest of friends are right down the tables here. They're wonderful people. I don't get up, up, I don't get upset if my team loses. I would like them to win. There's a lot of teams for different reasons that I appreciate. However, you're not. You're playing a game, and instead of being paid tens of millions of dollars every year. And the people that are the owners that get paid tens and tens and tens of million dollars every year. I hope that they give back to society to make the world a better place. If you're going to go live on a private island and offshore all your tax responsibilities and be selfish, then shame on you. I believe, I have a lot of friends that have been in the pro, pro uh, sports, and I would like to see a little more equity down the line for the uh, lower tier players. My favorite sport that I like to watch is golf. And the reason it is is because it's you, your caddy, and the course. And you have to have your act together. Uh, Tiger is very lucky that he's still playing. I like ethics. I appreciate rules of behavior. And I wish the pro sports would stop worshiping the dollar and profit. And uh, allow our children to respect sports uh, players that are that are still good men and women. It makes me nauseated that people are supporting those that, that are committing felonies and they do everything they can to make sure that they're protected. Who cares? If you care more about that and it's okay to do what these people do on occasion to others, then there's something wrong with you. If you have a problem with that, then you might want to look in the mirror and address what the hell is wrong with you. And you would start at your core, your ethics, your values, and whether or not you have humanity in your heart. If you don't, you might make a lot of money and be ego-driven, but when it's time for you to check out, you will not pass peacefully. But all that stuff will come back to you, and you reap what you sow. And I'll leave it with this. Love all, serve all, all is one. And if you can't appreciate that, then you need an attitude adjustment. And it will find you. Oh, oh, you're right about that. You're right about that. I got one more question for you. I, I, the last two years, what would you say is a favorite for you in horror? Is there something that you enjoyed? Or right. not even just for I mean, a movie of wise. I want to see the new Godzilla. Um, I haven't seen a lot in horror. I, I want to see Rob's Halloween. 
I, I go to a lot of independent film festivals. If you haven't been to one, I recommend it because you'll see films that are thought-provoking, well-written. They have passion. They have emotional content. You were in Lord, Lord, Lord of the Salem, right? Sort of. Sid and I got cut out. They used our faces for the advertising. When we were arresting the witches, two actors had the arrest warrants. They didn't know their lines. They said to Rob Zombie, Rob, can you make the torches brighter? I can't read the proclam their arrest warrant. Which is too sad because they'd been around a long time and they knew better. They were not prepared. They didn't know their lines. Rob would have made them glasses that looked vintage. But they came to work unprepared. That is not being professional. So because they did that, we all sat in our trailers for three hours, were sent home, and we never filmed the beginning of the movie that explains what was going on and why the witches were being arrested in the first place. I don't know why they didn't finish the footage that we needed to make the, the movie make sense. And I feel the movie is quite weak because we lost three and a half pages of scripted dialogue and scenes that stated the backstory. And I would like to see a studio support Rob Zombie to where if you lose some scenes, you can reshoot them to honor the efforts of the writers and the original content. And if you're an actor and you don't come prepared to the set, shame on you. Yeah, you're right. You're right on that. I'm and being a professional. On the internet, there's an interview with the gentleman who plays Gandalf in The Lord of the Rings, and the guy's asking him, what is your method? And he very brilliantly says the following. I get a script. It has words. I learn the words. I say the words. I pay attention to the camera and the lighting. My director tells me what levels and degrees of emotion that he would like me to portray at a certain point in time in the scenes. It's called acting. <laughs> well, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, you had great stories, and uh, I really appreciate you uh, sitting and having time to talk with us. Uh, it's been a pleasure. This has been a great show here at Fanboy. In, are we in Tampa? I think so. I think so. Either Tampa or Orlando. Somewhere in Florida. We're in Tampa. <laughs> I'm surprised you haven't played golf. I know you're a, a big golfer. Well, I play golf as often as I can at home in Washington State. But when I come to a show, I'm here to work. I don't run off, and I'm here for the fans. Yeah, and that's what it's all about. You, you come, you, fanboy, and I like how these, these conventions, they bring all these iconic actors and, and people that are still working, and we get to meet the people that we love. Well, we're always grateful to still be above ground and working. <laughs> uh, real quick, 